Hello goblins and ghouls, welcome back to The Quiet Riot. If you're new here, I'm Ainsley and this is where we talk film, television, and media. I have tried filming this earlier today, but unfortunately there was something that happened, maybe some kind of high-speed car chase going on, plenty of cops were speeding down and then you got had some helicopters so in between that and some other struggles i decided to to give it a second and now i am back because i have already let a lot of other things get in my way when filming this month i have been really exhausted a bit of a perfectionist and it's just made it harder for me to film and edit and I certainly didn't want more to get in my way because I am so excited to talk about one of my favorite horror films, my favorite horror film in the slasher subgenre, Halloween. Halloween is not the first slasher film that I ever saw or the first horror film that I ever saw, but it is definitely one of the early ones that I watched and I, I, I don't know exactly what it was at a young age that got me, but the more I started to really fall in love with film and become really research heavy when it came to knowing more about films and behind the scenes. Halloween is one of those movies that entranced me. It is a great movie that shows what you can do on a much smaller budget, which is really awesome. And we'll talk a little bit more about the things that they did to bring this movie to life. I would love to know your thoughts on Halloween we will be discussing Halloween and Michael Myers, particularly in that first movie. There will be mentions of sequels and the franchise and the franchise as a whole, but the majority of this discussion is going to be on the original Halloween, John Carpenter and Deborah Hill's Halloween, and Michael Myers himself, also referred to as The Shape. And I will be using both Michael, Michael Myers, and The Shape when discussing him. I note, I do have both the back and front door open to the screens so Miss Lemon could look out, as well as just to cool down the house. It's been or warm up the house I should say. It's been pretty cold in here and so you might hear Miss Lemon making a bit of a racket or any kind of like sounds from outside. I do apologize for that but hopefully it won't be like super bad or anything. Michael Myers has appeared in 13 movies that include sequels, remakes, and requels. Five separate timelines have been explored with changing relationships and motives. While Halloween didn't invent the slasher, it did invigorate the subgenre and began the golden age of slashers. It all began with Deborah Hill and John Carpenter's 1978 classic where the shape was brought to life. Michael a supernatural being or simply a man behind the mask. It all started in 1963 when a six-year-old Michael Myers killed his 15-year-old sister Judith Myers. He would go on to spend 15 years in a maximum security facility where he looked after and essentially studied by Dr. Samuel Loomis. On Halloween night in 1978, he escaped from the hospital and made his way to Haddonfield, Illinois, where he changed the lives of the town's residents forever. The film starts on a black screen as Halloween and the credits for the film begin to show up alongside a jack-o'-lantern that is moving closer to the screen. This is a great way to set the tone of both the simplicity as well as the general Halloween autumnal nature of the movie. And the score itself has really held up over the years. John Carpenter is a great composer and those that he works with also does an incredible job. I was really excited when he decided to come back along with his son and godson to do the scores for uh, David Gordon Green's Halloween trilogy and while I did not like Halloween Ends, I did really like Halloween and Halloween Kills, though I think Halloween Kills could have done with a much better name. But I, it was good to see John Carpenter come back to be a part of another Halloween film. The only other films that he was a part of was Halloween 2 that also featured Michael Myers and Halloween 3 Season of the Witch that did not feature Michael Myers. There were definitely hopes for this to somehow come into some sort of 
anthology films but unfortunately audiences wanted Michael Myers and they got what they wanted and he returned to the screen in Halloween 4. When I look at this original film I kind of prefer to look at it as a standalone film with no sequels and that includes Halloween 2, that includes the entirety of the franchise along with the David Gordon Green films. Though if you were to ask me what's my favorite sequel it would be Halloween 2018. I think it just it it packs more of a punch and it it takes out that kind of supernatural aspect of it while still having Michael be almost appear as both human and entity and uh, the way depending on what someone else is seeing because there are definitely people in real life that despite being human beings appear as if they could be some kind of demon some kind of devil or something like that so I, I find the character of Michael Myers interesting, especially when there's so much of him that we as an audience are left into our ter left to interpret on our own. And when we watch the original Halloween, there are no answers as to exactly why he's doing this. He is just seen as pure evil. And we get to know a little bit about that or more about that from Dr. Sam Loomis, who has known him for the past 15 years. Children are chanting as the camera moves from black onto the Myers house and suddenly everything goes silent and all we hear are the sounds of nature as someone moves towards the house. We see what's going on in this opening scene from the perspective of six-year-old Michael, though we do not know that this is six-year-old Michael at this point of watching it, and he ends up going to the side of the house where he sees his sister and her boyfriend in the living room. We do get to hear them talking to each other a bit and this comes into one of the things that makes this script so great is the work by Deborah Hill and how she crafted the language and the the things that these teenagers say and this comes into play a lot more later in terms of really seeing the authenticity, the authentic nature of the things that these teenagers are saying to each other, and that really comes off from the top of it. They end up going upstairs and Michael goes to the front of the house where he sees where he sees Judith's the light in Judith's room go out and there's this great I'm sorry, I'm not really great with my words when it comes to music, but you hear like a really sharp it's a sharp a note and then you see Michael go around to the back of the house where he enters into the kitchen and grabs a kitchen knife and then he goes into the living room where we end up seeing uh, Judith's boyfriend coming down the stairs and somehow he doesn't see Michael I don't know how that's even possible but he ends up exiting the house and Michael goes upstairs where he goes into his room and he picks up his mask from the floor and goes through his room into Judith's room. Now I think from what I could see it's his room and then it goes directly into Judith's room. My assumption is that she has both a door that goes into the hallway and one that connects hers with Michael's. But my question is why is she sitting there in her underwear with her top off? if she knows Michael's somewhere around. So, you know what? Um, people will be people and they'll do weird, dumb things. But anyway, Michael, carrying his kitchen knife, walks in and stabs her several times in the chest and stomach area. And this scene is not really, uh, it doesn't really show what would really be occurring in this situation as Michael kind of looks up and then like stabs and looks up and stabs. But I kind of see this as applying to his overall curiosity and his drive and want to know what it feels like to do this. She ends up falling to the floor, he leaves the room and he goes downstairs. When he leaves the house, he runs into his parents who arrive, they take off his mask and we see a six-year-old little boy there who, to be honest, kind of looks a little scared, but I think more so it is scared of the fact that he doesn't feel necessarily what he thought he would feel and, it, and it's hard to say when we're talking about a six-year-old boy who just happened to kill his sister but during this scene I really do like the scene 
but his parents are just standing there. And I, I, I think that it would have been a little bit better had there been a little bit more action where one of the parents may have ran inside the house and went looking for Judith and we hear like a scream or something. But overall, great opening scene and great introduction to Michael and Haddonfield and gets us ready for the rest of what this film is to be. We then cut to 15 years later where Dr. Loomis is being driven to the facility that holds Michael Myers with Nurse Marion. Now Nurse Marion seems to be a little nervous as she has never worked with Maxim security patients and she is just not a really big fan of the patients when they're talking and yammering on about anything really and you have uh, Dr. Loomis telling her that he doesn't talk and he refers to Michael as it and she's not a big fan of that either of the dehumanization of him she wants him to refer to him as him and he says if you say so they then arrive to the facility where they see that several patients are roaming the grounds and this is of course not something they should be doing especially at night they go up to the main gate where Dr. Sam Loomis ends up getting out of the car and going to the phone at the gate to call someone and Michael ends up jumping on to the top of the car where Nurse Marion rolls down her window thinking possibly there's not a human up there. I don't know what it is but it's not a human, I assume. And Michael ends up trying to strangle her. She gets away. He hits the, the other side with his palm. She skedaddles right on out of there and he gets inside the car and drives off uh in a facility since he was six years old but he drives like a pro the next day it is halloween in haddonfield illinois and we are introduced to our final girl Lori strode played by jamie lee curtis in her first role and her father comes out of the house and reminds her to drop off the keys at the Myers house. She runs in to Tommy Doyle, who she babysits on her way to the house, and puts the key underneath the mat. Tommy Doyle does not like that she has to go up there. There are a lot of rumors about what goes on in that house or what happened in that house many years ago. And of course, I'm sure there are some of these things that are, you know, truth of course uh, mixed with some exaggeration and a little tales of the boogeyman and sweet old michael myers the shape sees her and i believe this is just where he gets kind of attached to her and she becomes like the new judith myers for him as they walk along he comes out of the house and is looking at her as she is singing and goes and michael myers has his next victim. At the hospital, Sam Loomis is not super happy with the administrators and they are arguing and they don't possibly think that he could make it to Haddonfield because it is 150 miles away. But if we know anything about dear old Michael Myers, he can pretty much do anything and get anything done. So Sam Loomis ends up driving off. He is ready to go to Haddonfield to take care of things. At his school, Tommy Doyle is bullied and he ends up falling down onto his pumpkin. The bullies run away and one of them runs into Michael who is watching Tommy as he walks on the school grounds. We then see as Dr. Sam Loomis on his way to Haddonfield comes upon a truck where the gown that Michael was wearing is around the truck, but unfortunately he does not see the dead body that is there. I hope that he ended up calling someone to tell them what was going on. Lori is leaving the school with Linda and their friend Annie ends up catching up to him. And this is where a lot of the great friend dialogue happens. All of these three, they're very different. They have very strong personalities. And even though we don't get to spend a lot of time with Annie or Linda, we do get to know them and their personalities and who are they and who they are individually outside of just being friends of Lori's, which makes uh, everything a lot more impactful. While they are walking along, we have Michael in the car that he stole, slowing down and keeping an eye on them, and then he speeds up, and Annie ends up yelling, Hey, jerk! Speed kills! 
and they look on for a while as he stays there before he ends up speeding off. Shortly thereafter, when it is just Annie and Lori, he is standing near the bushes and Lori is the only one to see him. Annie goes to check on him, but he is not there behind the bushes. We did see in this section where he was doing some, where John Carpenter was doing some direction here while he was smoking a cigarette and you can see the smoke coming up from behind the bushes. At home, Lori sees Michael in her neighbor's yard looking up at her. Of course, she is definitely spooked by this. And when she looks away and then comes to look again, he is gone because again, Michael Myers, AKA The Shape can do anything apparently. She gets a call from Annie and in some good foreshadowing, Annie called her friend without finishing chewing. So she decided to chew, call her friend, she picks up and she's chewing. But this is a great little foreshadowing as to something that is going to happen next. Then she is picked up by Annie shortly thereafter so they can head to their babysitting jobs. And while they are in the car, they are being followed by Michael and they are also partaking in a joint together. And they come upon her father, Sheriff Brackett, who is on a job where a convenience store was broken into and various things have been stolen. And at this point, Michael, who's still following them, has pulled over. They end up going off and they drive off and Dr. Sam Loomis approaches Sheriff Brackett, who needs 10 minutes and then he'll end up talking to him. And behind him, you see where Michael goes to follow Annie and Lori once again, Annie drops her off and then goes next door to babysit. It turns out that Michael Myers has been a busy little bee while in Haddonfield because when Loomis went to check Judith Myers' grave, the headstone was taken. And again, I know that uh, Michael Myers seems to be able to get anything done, but he's definitely the strong one. He's definitely a, a strong, silent type. Annie is ready to go see her boyfriend, and she is the one that is being watched at this point in time by Michael. She has to put her clothes into the wash, and as she is in there and gets stuck, Michael is watching her. I love the way the moments in which Michael is watching people uh, whether it be Annie or the others, seeing him in shadow, the way they film his mask, and the look of his mask, and honestly, the fact that that mask was a Captain Kirk mask, a William Shatner mask, is still crazy to me to this day, but it's awesome. I love, I love mask lore, and all makeup lore that these, uh, killers have. And she ends up taking Lindsay to Tommy's so Lori can watch her because she's gonna go pick up her boyfriend and then bring him back to the house. But what she doesn't know is that the shape has other plans because when she gets into the car, she noticed and says, you know, someone's been breathing in here. And Michael ends up strangling her, which is his second favorite way to kill somebody, you know, after kitchen knife. She dies. Then we have Linda and her boyfriend Paul comes to the house. They know, thanks to Lori, that she went to pick up her boyfriend, Bob, I believe. Bob. It's Bob. Is it Bob? It's Bob. They go upstairs, do the deed, and she wants a beer. She's a girl who knows what she wants. She's very assertive. She tells her man to go get her a beer. And unfortunately, that was his doing because he went down into the kitchen and he thinks someone's paying a little trick on him, but no, Michael's somewhere in there. Is he, where's he at? Because he comes out, pins that man to the wall with a kitchen knife, which is definitely impossible. But again, Michael Myers can get things done. This is my favorite scene of the entire movie. I love the way Michael Myers looks up at the dangling corpse of Paul. He looks like a, a curious dog that, uh, that just wants to know what's going on. And I very much think of Michael Myers as a uh, rabid 
dog who is curious and plays with his food. That is how I interpret Michael Myers to be, especially at this in this iteration. Michael Myers ends up going upstairs where he is dressed in a white sheet to appear like a ghost and he is wearing Paul's glasses. And Linda is not too pleased with this joking around, so she calls Lori. And when she calls Lori, she ends up getting strangled by the phone cord. And this is where the chewing debacle thing that Annie decided to do comes back into play because she thinks that this is just Annie just doing some things again. She's a bit taken aback by it. She feels like there's maybe something sinister going on. And our poor Tommy has just been scared by the shape because he did end up witnessing Michael carry the body of Annie from the garage back into the house. And he has seen Michael once before as well. So he's definitely believing that there's some kind of boogeyman walking around Haddonfield and that he's gonna get him. This kid is gonna be traumatized for sure. Lemus is in the neighborhood. He has found the stolen car. Sheriff Brackett goes to see the car, so he's taking care of that while Loomis is just walking all around, nervous with everything that is going on. Lori ends up going over to the house where she stumbles upon the dead body of Annie and Judith Meyer's headstone is behind her. Paul comes down dangling uh, and she's freaking out and she ends up getting, Michael tries to stab her and he gets her arm and she ends up tumbling over the banister and down the stairs. And honestly, I think that this would have been a far, you know what, good for her, good for her. She gets up, she goes, she goes on running. She goes over to the Doyle's house. She wants to um, take care of the kids, make sure they're okay but he ends up arriving there. They get into a bit of a tussle. There's a fight going on. And she ends up using her knitting needle. Uh, she drops the knitting needle. Cause that's what she does in this movie. She drops every weapon at her disposal. She ends up going to get the kids, make sure they are in a hiding space. She goes into a closet. And this is where when Michael comes in, he's trying to get her through it because he can't open a damn door, right? Apparently. So he busted on in. And in the only thing, that wire hangers are good for is poking out the eye of Michael Myers. He's incapacitated. She goes, obviously she's a bit taken aback. Kids are out screaming. Lemus sees this, he comes in. Michael gets up, she gets up, walks. She does not see that he, she does not feel, I feel like it, during this situation, I would be feeling every single thing around me. I would be thinking I'm followed. I would be thinking there's eyes on me at all possible times, but he ends up coming through and strangles him because again, this is his third favorite way of killing people is strangling them. But Loomis comes up the stairs and she takes off his mask. He's got to put it back on. He does. He cannot be seen with his face. That mask is important to Michael Myers now. That mask is a part of him. Loomis ends up shooting him several times. He goes into the room, he stands there, Loomis comes around into the room, he shoots him multiple times, and then he goes over the balcony, he's on the ground. Will he be there for long? Probably not. Lori ends up asking Loomis if that's the boogeyman, and he says, in fact, it is the boogeyman. Then Sam Loomis goes to check on Michael, and shocker, surprise, he is not there. Sam Loomis is looking on in what can be, I assume, not necessarily shock, but exasperation. Laura is crying, breaking down in tears. And then the music starts to play as we see various shots of the house and neighborhood and hear the heavy breathing of Michael. Halloween. And then there's the credits.
Halloween is a tale of what can happen in a small town where nothing ever really happens. Oftentimes you will hear about a crime that occurs, especially one that's quite brutal, where someone will say, stuff like this doesn't happen here. But the truth is, stuff like that always happens, no matter if it's in a small town or a big city. Of course, big cities have higher crime rates because they also have higher populations. But brutal crimes like this can also happen in a small small town in Illinois. And here we had, and 15 years ago, a six-year-old Michael Myers murders his teenage sister. And 15 years later, he escapes from a facility where he returns to his hometown to continue his crimes. There's many questions about what motivates Michael Myers. And in my opinion, is it, it is his curiosity and the fact that he ended up getting a taste for blood that Halloween night in 1963, he desires to continue, continue upon his rampage. He's quite methodical. He loves to play around, is a bit of a jokester, and he is patient. And that is something that Dr. Sam Loomis mentions. Not only does he refer to him as evil, but he also refers to him as a patient person. He's been waiting for 15 years to do this. Michael was sent away after killing his children, and in those 15 years, everything went back to normal, or at least as normal as they can be. His parents left having lost a child and essentially losing two children that night. My assumption is they don't visit him at all. And there is a sense of isolation in that, and at the end of the day, Michael, I believe, well, probably was very much the person he would become. So much of that evil also came out of having a lack of humanity around him and not really being treated like a human. I don't think that Dr. Sam Loomis is at fault here, but I do think he plays a role in the dehumanization of Michael and what Michael would end up becoming in his 20s. At 21, I see Michael as a rabid, curious dog. He plays with his food, so to speak. He loves tricking and scaring people, and not only does he feed off of the death and the blood and everything that comes with it, he also feeds off the fear and the confusion of others. Michael is the personification of evil. He is something inhuman that has no real definition, but has somehow come to be in a human man. He is the bad lurking in the shadows. When I think of Michael Myers, I think of a black hole. Anything that comes towards him ends up being crushed. And we can see a lot more of that in the various sequels and requels that have occurred. When it comes to Halloween 2018, we see that Michael has once again escaped after 40 years in a facility. And this time he is angry as hell. I really like that change as opposed to what really occurs between Halloween 2 and Halloween H2O. And I think that the personification that occurs in Halloween is really volcano erupting. And I see in Halloween him very much as like a volcano who is really starting to bubble up and become a part of its own. Michael Myers being considered the shape is very much, uh, he is a canvas in which one's own fears can be painted on. Michael Myers is interesting to me because of that. He is not evil in the sense of what many of us think of when we think of evil. He is evil in the sense that, yeah, there's nothing behind those eyes. But reality is that he is rabid and curious and it's all in the head tilt, baby. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to watch and or listen to this video. I really do appreciate it. I'm sorry for not having as much as I wanted to. It's just been a crazy month for me in terms of exhaustion and perfectionism apparently but i'm really glad that i gotta get this video finished for you and up and i hope that you like it happy halloween you goose you goose <laughs> happy halloween you ghost goblins gremlins you ghouls i hope that you have an incredible halloween and i really hope that you have an incredible halloween 
Please comment below your thoughts on Michael Myers' Halloween. What's your favorite film in the franchise? Do you like the first film? Do you not? I would love to hear from you. Give this video a like if you enjoyed it and subscribe and ring that bell to be notified every single time I post. I would love to have you here on The Quiet Riot. If you have any requests, recommendations, anything you'd love to see on the channel, please let me know in the comments below and I'll see you next time. Bye!